Welcome to Super Agents Live. This is the one place where you can come and hear the most successful people in real estate. You'll hear how these super agents built their businesses, how they stay productive, and how they stay motivated. Who am I? My name's Toby Salgado, and I made my first million in real estate. And I'm your host for the next 30 minutes while we talk to yet another amazing real estate entrepreneur. Stay tuned. Let's go! On the show today, we have Pat Hyben. Pat is part of the Billion Dollar Club and a New York Times bestselling author. In his career, he has sold over $1 billion in real estate and found the time to write his book, Six Steps to Seven Figures. Pat, thanks, thanks for taking the time out today. Hey, Toby. My pleasure. Well, I've given a brief overview of you, Pat. Um, why don't you take a minute and tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, your current projects? Yeah, sure. Um, basically, what you need to know is I'm... Uh, a resident of Columbia, Maryland, which is a small suburb in between Baltimore and Washington, D.C. I've been in business over 25 years now. Um, I um, started out when I was 21 years old. Now I am 47. Uh, My whole life has basically been real estate, and that includes my investment life. I um, I had to lay out my financial plan for a uh, bank the other day, and the guy looked at me and said, man, you are the truest real estate guy I've ever met. <laughs> and uh, he's used to seeing you know, people with different stocks and different holdings and things like that. So I guess that was a compliment. Um, in any event, um, I started out in 1987 full-time, right out of college. I graduated with a... 2.3 GPA, uh, what was it, 2.6, two 2 something um, from college, and uh, uh, really struggled getting a decent job or any job. And I went into the uh, job that had uh, really no barrier to entry, and that was a full time realtor. And I uh, became a full time realtor, sold 10 houses my first year, made 13000 um, bucks. My best year, I sold uh, five. I made over five. I made five point three million. So I went from you know earning thirteen thousand a year to five point three million a year uh, gross commissions. And um, now, essentially, what I've done is I've uh, I've sold my business to my business partner Mike Sloan. He pretty much runs the day to day operations. Um, I can go into how we split it up and that sort of thing later if that's one of the questions. And um, I uh, live on horizontal income. I have uh, six apartment buildings that I'm a principal in. I have uh, about four other commercial properties. I have um, about 10 uh, residential houses that I rent out. Um, I am a principal in six different private companies. Um, all which pays me horizontally across the line, a total of about 29 things to pay me horizontally so that I don't have to um, earn on a daily basis um, and uh, all my bills are paid uh, by the 29 horizontal lines. So uh, I guess that's about it. How's that? Well, I wrote the book, which you mentioned, and it pretty much tells you how I went from... 13,000 to 5 million and how you can do it too. Wow. Wow. So you're, I mean, yeah, I, I understand now why you're, uh, your broker, I mean, you, your asset allocation is real estate. That's it. There's no, there's no mix in that. So you got in private companies. That's it. So you, you didn't have, you, you had a 2.6 GPA. You went out, tried to find a job, couldn't get a job. And why were you attracted to real estate, Pat? You know, I'll be honest with you, you know, I don't want to sugarcoat this. I mean, you know, a lot of people say, oh, I love real estate because I love looking at houses and looking at nice fireplaces and all that, but that wasn't the key. I don't have that gene in me. Um, I was never really like, oh, this is a cool house still to this day. Um, It was more of two reasons. Number one, I've always had kind of a chip on my shoulder. I never really wanted to have a boss. I had some bosses when I was... 16, 17, and some coaches that that never put me in the game, and some bosses that were real condescending, and I I just always hated the boss complex, uh, and so I I um, wanted to work for myself. I wanted to be my own boss, 
And and two, I realize the um, financial aspect of real estate commissions. I had friends at the time when I graduated college that you know went and got jobs selling phone systems or or Xerox machines or or uh, lighting fixtures or whatever it may be, and they would get a, a you know a ten or fifteen percent commission on um, uh, a five hundred dollar sale or a. On a thousand dollar sale, and the commission would be 150 bucks or whatever. And I saw real estate. I said, "Man, here, here, I could sell a house, even if it's a hundred thousand. And the commission on that's three percent, and half of that's, you know, fifteen hundred. Um, I can make fifteen hundred dollars or two thousand dollars a sale versus two hundred or twenty dollars a sale. And I just logically it just didn't make sense for me to go and sell anything else." but um, something with big, fat commission. So that's that's the two reasons why, honestly. I love it. Was, it. There was no emotion in it. I love it. So lots of folks are, you know, they want to, I mean, I mean, they would aspire to have your success. I mean, you've had success, $5.3 million, your biggest year earning, and now you have 29 uh, streams of income. That is unbelievable. What do you think the biggest hurdle is for real estate entrepreneurs what do they have to overcome to be successful? Well, um, let's just talk about real estate, and then we can talk about entrepreneurs. Because there's, I mean, uh, let's talk about agents and then entrepreneurs. Or do you want me to just focus on one? No, no. I, you know, that, that's very interesting because you know, as I see it, uh, you know, I think people do make a divide: real estate agent and then entrepreneur. And you know, if, for me personally, if I think about it. You know, real estate agents are entrepreneurs. They are building their their own companies. They have to build their own brand. They have to hire their own teams. So I, I see them really as one and the same. Do, do, you, do am I mistaken in in? Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, there's certainly people that that are real estate agents for thirty or forty years and never buy a single piece of real estate outside of their primary residence. Um, um, but yes, I think that or or, or still do everything themselves. Um, but for the most part, I think that most real estate agents are entrepreneur hearted in that they enjoy working for themselves. Um, they enjoy making commissions and, and enjoy being, um, pressured to, um, to earn versus, you know, being paid, um, enjoy the insecurity of it, let's say. Um, and, um, and so that makes them entrepreneurs right there. So yes. Um, and so the question is, what is the biggest challenge? No, the biggest hurdle. What do they have to overcome to hurdle. be successful? Well, there's really, in, in my opinion, there's, there's really two words that define a good agent. Uh, and those two words are follow up. You know, if you're if you're a good follow up and you're demon on the phone and you're picking up the phone and bugging somebody who tells you they're going to buy a house in 2014 in the fall, and you're calling them every month saying, "Hey, just checking in, seeing if you you know need anything, or you driven past any signs that looked interesting, or blah blah blah," blah which most agents would never do, um, you're going to sell those people a house. And follow up is what makes and breaks agents. The agents that don't do well, they don't follow up well. The agents that do well, they're they're often at follow up. And so I think that's the hurdle they got to overcome is understanding that it's okay to bug people, that it's okay to be assertive, that it's okay to follow up. That's amazing. Uh, so for fear of losing the deal. Is is that why you think they don't follow up? The, I mean, wh why don't they follow up if it's if it's so essential? Why don't people get this basic concept? Yeah, number one, they probably believe that the person really is going to buy a house in the fall of next year, where in reality, we all know it, they would probably end up buying in the spring. Um, and um, they don't want the rejection associated with two out of five, they're going to tell them that they're too assertive. Mm. You know? Um, but... Um, and that's probably why, you know, they're, they're probably, there's an old saying that I use a lot, which is the cat that sits on the hot stove never sits on the hot stove or the cold stove again. 
you know? And um, I think real, uh, realtors, if they're poor and follow up, it's because someone screamed at them once and they never want to follow up with anybody else ever again. Got it. Got it. Well, you and your journey here, you, you know, you, you started out at a, at a tough spot. Again, 2.6 GPA, couldn't get a job. Was there ever a time when you felt like it was just too hard and you wanted to quit? And how did, how did you push through that roadblock and find success? There was. Um, one time, uh, I remember sitting in my driveway, and I think it was like the early 90s. It was probably like 1992. And, and you know, at that time, I, you know, if I did whatever, let's say I did 30 deals a year, right? If you had some of these domino deals fall through, like someone you listed someone's house and sold it and then sold them another house. And I, you know, this is terrible, terrible um, thing, but I actually had a woman's house for sale in a bereavement group because she had lost uh, a family member and she referred me to two other people in the same bereavement group and I had had a couple of good transactions through this bereavement group. Sometimes we just go through these, um, you know, uh, referrals all seem to come at once from similar style people. But in any event, to make a long story short, I made a, I made a mistake and I, I had forgot to put on a, um, I put a house on the market, but put, uh, this was back in the day when you had um, showing instructions, you had to call the front desk of the office and they would give you instructions. And I had had uh, put a sticky note that said, you know, no showings till further notice because for some reason I can't remember. And it was on the market like a month and never got showed because it was a sticky note at the front desk. Anyway, this lady called me out and screamed at me six ways a Monday and fired me and uh, canceled, uh, fired me from selling her house, canceled the house she was buying, told her friends in the breathing group that I was an asshole and, and you know, sorry about that, um, that I was an idiot. Hopefully you can edit this. I can. Okay. Um, told everybody in the breathing group that, that I was an idiot and, and, and they fired me too. And I remember sitting there like, I don't need this because if I have 30 deals a year and I just lost four, um, uh, that was a big deal. You know, I might now not get a settlement for six weeks, you know? And so to make a long story short, I remember sitting uh, in my driveway in my car, just playing out becoming a lawyer. And I thought, you know what? I can do that. I can, I can go to law school and I can become a lawyer. And I was thinking about what type of law I would do and blah, 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 blah. But luckily I never did that. And, um, I think that the way to overcome that, to answer your question, is to just um, is to simply just keep going to work, you know, keep plugging away, and and uh, we all get our heads kicked in, and uh, you can't quit, you know. I mean, that's all part of the game. It's a lesson learned by me, um, several lessons learned by me, and and uh, you got to chalk everything up to a lesson. That's interesting. Was there any specifically? Did you? Was there anything that you did that? that I mean, how did you turn that around? I mean, that's a tough place to be. You know, you, you you just you make a mistake, you get fired, you get yelled at, and you're thinking about changing careers. I mean, what what did you do the next day that to say, hey, listen, this is just a learning lesson. I can get over this and move on. I got busy. You know, I just jumped right back into it and. I said, you know, okay, I can't sit here and focus on this, these lost commissions. Although the back of my mind wanted to, I had to just focus on how can I make new money today, you know? And I just stayed busy. And I think that a lot of agents make that mistake is that they don't stay busy. They, they go, in my book, I talk about the 12 ways to get out of a slump. And, um, you know, one of those 12 ways is just be busy, just get busy, you know, whether it's showing houses, whether it's calling on listings that you might normally not call on because you think they're overpriced or just those or going to parties that you're invited to and hand out as many cards as you can. Just be busy and uh, things will come into your universe, you know, sales will come into your universe. You just have to 
keep pushing forward. I love it. Pat, what do you think the single biggest thing that most realtors get wrong? Uh, they, they don't treat it. They don't treat the job of being a real estate salesperson the same way they would treat a job as being a different type of salesperson. You know, they think that, um, you know, like you hear about people that, uh, at any sales at any sales force of a company, it, it, you can just visualize the salespeople coming to work and cold calling. Um, just follow up. You know, they do their daily cold calling people, trying to sell them a service or, or a product or whatever, and they're follow follow up masters. And um, I think real estate agents, a lot of them, the mistake they make is they don't treat it like a real job, like a real salesperson job. They don't want to admit that they are at heart a salesperson. They think that they're above that, that terminology salesperson, that they're, you know, uh, counselors or, uh, some other fancy term for it, uh, which great, which they are at some point, but you need to be a salesperson first and foremost. And the part of being a salesperson is, um, calling people on the telephone and engaging them and asking for orders. Got it. Yeah, you, you have to. So do you think it's the, the – is that a skill that people don't uh, – that are not – they're not honing that skill or they just are, are viewing their career as a real estate agent as uh, something different? Yeah, I think that the management is not telling them that's a requirement. Got it. You know, I can't speak to all different companies, but, but I've worked at, I guess, five companies now, and I've had my own company, um, and um, I think that a, a few of them that I worked at, that wasn't, that, you know, they were just worried about the, you know, the, putting the agents in and hoping some of them stuck to the wall, and, and some companies are better at, at talking to the agents about like, okay, we need to hone your follow-up skills. We need to hone your prospecting skills, you know, your lead generating skills. Um, and, uh, I think that's important. I think that the realtor that forgets about lead generation, uh, is, is one that, um, may be likely to have, peaks and valleys that are not necessary. Yeah, you got to keep that funnel always filled up. Well, for you, Pat, you know, tell us about your first breakthrough deal or that first eureka moment you had. Well, I'll tell you about one of them. I mean, um, I've had a lot of, unfortunately, in real estate, the, the eureka moments come when you're laying on the ground and someone's kicking you in the stomach uh, because you lost the listing or a deal fell apart or whatever. Um, you know, and I've got a ton of them. Uh, here's one. I, I remember I went to a listing appointment, and this is a person that I had been following up brilliantly with for like two years, like literally like – they knew they never met me, but they knew me on the phone, and they, um, you know, we always enjoyed talking to each other, and blah 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 blah. And I was in a mood. Okay, so it came time they were getting ready to put their house on the market. So they're like, "Pat, we're ready to list it." I'm like, "Cool, I'll be over." And so I go over. I guess I'm in a mood about price because I had some listings that were overpriced. And I felt like, you know, I need to be conservative about price. So I go over there in a very conservative mindset and I look at the house. It ends up I wasn't prepared. They did not have a basement. Their house was on a slab and I brought all the comps with no no no. The, the, their house had a basement and there was a comp next door to theirs that had a slab. And I brought that over as the main comp. And they were like, well, no, that's got, that had a basement and this has a slab. 
the top of the slab. And I said, okay, well, that doesn't really give you that much. And, and um, you know, I, I gave them this big list of things they needed to get the house ready to fix up for sale. I was very conservative on price. Um, they, they gave, they signed all the paperwork. They gave me the keys. Um, they gave me all their floor plans from the builder and their plat of the yard. I mean, I was there for like three hours collecting all the information and we were ready to go. It was going to come on the market soon. And I was ready to list it. And the next day I got a call and here's the lady. And I thought everything went well. I was like, yeah, I got this listing. Obviously I got the listing, right? All the papers signed, everything, got the keys. Um, and she's like, you know, we stayed up all night. And I said, why? And she said, because you came to our house and you did not say one positive thing. She said, little did you know, but we have been, we are, are at, at the time there was no such term as like a hoarder, but they had a lot of clutter. And she said, little did you know, but we've spent the last nine months decluttering this house, like cleaning it up, throwing stuff away. And you came over and pointed out all kinds of other negative things that we needed to do. We, we felt like you hated our house, that there's not one positive thing you said about our house. Um, all you would do is say, you know, negative things about why the price should be lower and why, um, we needed to do more and we've been working for nine months and, and we're very proud of the work we've done and you did not give us any warm, sunny feelings at all. And, um, we want our keys back. We want the listing agreement back. We want everything back. And so I had to drive all that stuff back over there and hand it to them. And then of course they uh, called another agent, a competitor, and he came over and, told him he loved their house and everything else and listed the house and it sold in a weekend. I remember watching it in MLS it sold in the weekend and, and, um, he made, you know, a bunch of money and they probably gave him several referrals after that. And I just remember being feeling so down about that because, um, because it was a hundred percent me. I mean, I had that listing was mine. Um, and it was because I, ha I wasn't at the time a very complimentary person, you know, and I realized that, you know, I needed to be more complimentary. I needed to be more, I needed to pretend, even if I'm pretending that I love their house, right? You don't want someone to sell your house for you that's not in love with it like you are. Right? How in the world can I sell the house if I'm going around pointing out all the negative things? Does that make sense? Yeah, that's an interesting story. I mean, so you spent two years developing this customer, two years yeah. following up, and in one afternoon, the first time they meet you, you blow it, and you blow it because uh, it sounds like you know you were focused. You know, you you started the story with you were in a mood, um, so you were not fo you were focusing more on you than them. And is, is that I mean. Yeah, absolutely. At, or their house. I right. mean, you know, I, I wasn't telling them, oh, you got a great house. I love it. Da, 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 da. And I, even if I didn't mean it, I think that it was important after that for me to every single house. It, and what I did from that day forward, and it was a great lesson. I mean, it hurt really bad, but it was a great lesson in that I haven't left the house since then ever. Well, I didn't stop them at some point and say, you have a great house. Right. I love this house. You know what I mean? Even if the house wasn't that great, I would tell them, you have a good house. This is a good house. And look them in the eye and make sure they knew that I believed in their house because they won't hire somebody who doesn't believe in them and their house. Yep. That's just how it is, you know? Well, Pat, let me say this. You are a great guest. <laughs> I'm just joking with you. Hey, hey, Pat, so you, ha again, going back to your 29 streams of income, that's incredible. You have tons of stuff going on, private companies, apartment buildings to manage. How do you stay productive and focused on a day-to-day -day basis? On what? 
<laughs> on 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 whatever you're doing. I mean, uh, how do you uh, how do you keep your how do you keep focused? I mean, where where do you how do you spend your time to to stay productive? You know, I mean, you're an author. You you, you have properties that you manage uh, and companies that you are involved with. I'm sure you sit on the board. Yeah. Yeah, I'm pretty much an implementer, you know, or or a doer, and 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 then I'm at I'm lucky that I'm at a point now where I, I don't have to stay focused on any one thing. Like I give you an instance of of the six companies that the six private companies that I have ownership in, and I, I own on. Um, the lowest end, two percent of a company, and on the highest end, fifty percent of a company. So, all of my companies are are, are not the, the 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 larger portion of it where I'm having to be daily focused and daily responsible for it. And I did that on purpose because I didn't want to have to be involved, other than maybe some financial meetings or, or, or things like that, where I could you know, throw my two cents in, but I didn't want to be, you know, responsible for holding them up. I'd rather be a silent partner. In the same way with the, like the houses that I own are all managed by somebody else. I just, I, the, the finances are all managed by someone else. I just look at what's in the bank account and, and, and what money came in. Um, same thing with the apartment buildings. I don't own, I own all my apartment buildings anywhere from, I think 35% is the the highest and 10% is the lowest. So, you know, we have management companies that manage them. Um, um, Rents come in, bills are paid. I get my 30% cut of the profit and, you know, I get a K-1 at the end of the year and I, you know, we have a couple meetings where I might, we might meet once a year with the other owners or whatever it is, you know, it's all, it's, uh, I prefer it that way, you know. I I spent, you know, my my hard I call them hardcore years, the years where I um, had the most energy to focus on one thing, um, focusing really hard on you know selling more houses and and building that income. Uh, more vertically, like, you know, you make 100000 one year, you're going to vertically raise it to 125 then you're vertically going to raise it to 200 whatever. And so I don't focus on any vertical income right now. The only thing I focus on is horizontal income. How can I add a 30th piece to my horizontal line of, of income? I call that horizontal income, obviously. Um, that's my focus. Uh, I just invested in a, an apartment building Um that uh, I traded some emails back and forth about yesterday. Um, I'm uh, looking at a property. There's a, uh, you know, I've used up all my loans. You can you can only get ten mortgages. I'm I'm tapped out, but um, I have a mentee that's 26 that doesn't have any mortgages, and he came to me and said, "How about we buy ten houses together, and I use up my ten, and we both own." 50% of these properties. And I said, hey, it sounds like a great deal for me and a great deal for you. So I went and looked at one we're considering, um, and, I, and I'd love to add 10 more to that, you know, horizontal line, so that would make 40, you know. Um, so to answer your question about focus, my focus is, is solely right now, all my focus is, is adding things to my passive income st- streams. Adding passive income streams. That's all I focus on. Well, that is a great place to be. So you, you said you have a mentee. Uh, how how important do you think is it to, to uh, when you're starting out, or maybe you've been doing real estate for a while and you've been mildly successful? How important is it to have a mentor? Oh, I think it's extremely important. As a matter of fact, it's one of my six steps. Um, I believe it's step number four is uh, get a mentor, and I talk about. In the book, I talk about you know three or four mentors that I've had, and then I talk about uh, how I I went from having mentors to having mentees, and I still have new mentors, but I'm now building mentees. Like I said, I'm 47, so I'm at a point where I'm building mentees more than I'm building mentors. 
Um, it's huge. Um, when I um, when I released the book two years ago, I did a fifty three uh, city tour of different cities uh, speaking to promote the book, and uh, that was probably the number one question. Is um, people would come up to me afterwards and say, you know, I'm a new agent and I don't know who to approach as a mentor. And my question to my answer to them was go to the rookie of the year in your office because they had the same challenge you did only a year ago, having never sold a house before. And they became the rookie of the year and you want to find out exactly what they did. And they're probably most willing to share because they're fresh and new and, you know, happy to, um, uh, you know, it's a compliment to them that you come in and ask them for advice. Got it. So and and, and yeah. how so how formal is that is that mentee mentor uh, relationship? I mean, is it something where um, with your mentees? I mean, do you get on a phone call once a week and and talk to them or or uh, t- tell me about that relationship? You know, it's probably to uh, different 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 degrees. I mean, I have right now nine thousand friends on on Facebook. Um, I have. 5,000 under Pat Hyben and 4,000 are Patrick Hyben. And, and, and I guess there's some people on there that I'm friends with that I never met that, that throw questions at me and ask me things. And I always respond. And I guess at some level, they're, they're a mentee um, just as, say, someone like Tony Robbins, um, who I just met last month but for probably 20 years, he was my mentor, even though I never met him. Um, some people have feel that they might be my mentee or I might be their mentor, which is great. Uh, there are other people that are more formal. Um, you know, for instance, uh, Jason Gennady, who I mentioned to you, who were buying houses together. Um, with Jason, you know, what happened was Jason, actually I met Jason in a Subway sandwich shop when he was 18 years old. So that was eight years ago. Um, he had seen, he was local uh, high school kid. He'd seen me on television. He was hanging out with his friends, getting ready to order a sub, and there was a long line. And all of a sudden I hear this um, kind of muffled voice. And I look over and there's like eight kids there and they're all giggling because they figure that I can't figure out which one of them yelled my name. So I walked over to him, and I, and I knew who it was. I just knew where the voice came from, and I said, that was you. And uh, he was like, how do you know? How do you know? Da, 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 da. And um, anyways, I gave him a card, and lo and behold, he called me the next day, and he said, hey, you know, I just told my dad last night that I'm not going to college. <clears throat> and he told me that if I didn't go to college, that I had to find a mentor, someone who was successful that I can follow around, and they can pay me whatever they want to pay me and I have to do whatever they want me to do uh, just so I can learn from them. And I said, great, come on in. So he was clearly a kid who wanted, uh, at least he, you know, he thought he wanted and he did, uh, his dad was right, um, to be a mentee. And, and he took direction from me, and uh, we stayed in touch. And um, so now, actually, I helped fund a company that he started, and I own a portion of his company. And uh, we're going to start investing in real estate. And we meet, you know, I, I like to hike, and uh, at least once a month we'll go hiking together um, and just talk. Uh, and and uh, we formally review goals every year. I have about five, five or six mentees that I sit down with once a year and review goals, review their aspirations, uh, help keep them accountable to certain goals. If they want to lose 20 pounds, you know, I'll text them and say, hey, take a snapshot of your scale or and text it to me or how are you doing with, with your diet or, or whatever. Whatever their goal is uh, and they want to be held accountable, I'll help them with that. And that, those are my more formal mentees. Wow, that is a great story. I love it. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to ask you something a little bit. This may not be your background. That's fine. But so how do you think sites like Zillow and Trulia have changed the way buyers, sellers, and agents interact? 
Well, clearly they claimed the MLS to be a platform of the people, to be for public public domain like airwaves are or the national parks are, you know, um, or, or whatever you want to say. Um, they are, you know, I can remember before they came out or when they were coming out, you know, there was all kinds of, of money being thrown in the funds for attorneys that were going to fight to protect um, the MLS. You know, without the MLS, our commissions are going to drop you know, the flat fees, you know, and, uh, that was a big scare tactic that, that everyone was believing. Um, and of course it didn't happen. It just helped, uh, help make our jobs easier actually. Um, and better, but, uh, it, it definitely transformed the industry so that, uh, you know, the information is out there and people can look at stuff and be that much more informed when they call in and or email in and ask about a house. Um, so, I mean, they're huge. All, all those things are huge. And, and you know, truly, uh, um, a realtor.com, a, you know, Zillow, whatever, if you're a single agent or at a company that has a limited number of offices, there's only so much money that you're going to be able to spend uh, to get people to, you know, look at what's on your page. And, and those companies, I am going to guess, you know, have so much more money to spend and, and have so much more power that they're not going away and, um, and, and they're, they're, you know, yeah. Well, have you, have you done any marketing on those sites and, and yeah. How's, yeah. That, how's that worked for you? Well, some of them, um, some of them, it's all about, you know, getting the people that put referrals up there about you. Like truly, for instance, um, uh, you know, I've seen some agents that have, like can put on there that they sold 20 houses through Truly and have 20 uh, recommendations through Truly and then and and and, it, and, it, and they do a ton of business through it. So some of them you have to build, others you have to just pay money. I know that you can pay money, you know, the Realtor.com and the leads seem to be a lot more solid and and. Um, uh, higher price range and maybe some of the other leads that you might get on your own, uh, depending on what you have on your own site. Um, so everything works, nothing doesn't. Uh, I would warn some agents that, um, you know, sign the shortest contract you can. I know we've, we've signed up with a couple of them and they haven't, um, paid off the way we were told that they would or we expected them to and we got out of them and it wasn't a big deal um, but you don't want to get stuck in something long term if it's not working so you know test it first test it for a small period of time or a small zip code first and if it works if you can turn some commissions off of it great bear in mind that again it goes back to what we said at the very beginning of this call it's all related to follow up you know, you can pay, you know, thousands of dollars every month for search engine optimization, but if your follow-up is poor, you're not going to turn any of that into commissions. Um, so, you know, most of the battle is follow-up. Right. Okay. Pat, if you could recommend only one book, what would it be? Besides Six Steps to Seven Figures? Yes. Okay. Huh. Um you know, a great book for referrals and for um, uh, building your referral brand and your um, your past clients and that sort of thing is 7L by Michael J. Mayer. Uh, it's an excellent book. Um, I highly recommend it. All right. Do you have an internet tool like an Evernote that you're in love with? Group Me. I like group me. It basically allows you to um, keep groups. So you don't have to keep 
creating group conversations with people or scroll down on your phone to find um, a past conversation. For instance, on, on group me, I have a group that's just my family. I have, uh, and, and anyone in the group me doesn't have to have an iPhone or a smartphone so they can be in a group conversation without having to have that. It doesn't show up as uh, the, uh, the text came from some random person that they don't know who it is. It's on the group. Um, so anyways, it, 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 I have about it, being an owner of six companies and being um, involved in so many different little things. I have groups for all of them. So if I want to, for instance, I own part of a payroll company and I have the two other owners of that same payroll company on a group me. And if I need something, I just hit the button on group me for infinity HR and I can send a met, uh, send a little text and it goes to both of them. Or I can send photos or whatever I need to send a video. Um, and it just goes to everybody and I, you know, it saves, it just saves time and it's got it. A funner That's way to do it. It's a good one. What are the first three steps a new agent should do to begin building his business in the next 10 days? 10 days. I mean, you know, Floyd Wickman, one of my mentors used to always say, you know, Cito, come into office. Um, the first thing they got to do in 10 days, they probably for each of those 10 days, Cito, um, come into office, just get them to come into the office and sit down and, and work, you know? Um, uh, so when you come, that would be step one. Step two would be uh, start creating a database. Everybody you possibly know, you know, if you were to die, who would you come? Who would come to your funeral? Um, and then maybe do six degrees of separation from those people. Who are some people that they're friends with? Or just if you have a Facebook account, go to your Facebook. And, and that list of all those people that you're friends with on Facebook, that's your prospecting list. Um, and that would be it right there. So build a database of those people. And then the third step, which is the most important step, would be uh, start calling. And that would be, you know, by the second day, you should start calling. Again, you are a salesperson, right? Imagine the type of business that you're going to do is by the second day of your license, you picked up the phone and are calling everybody you're friends with on Facebook and saying, hi, you know, I'm now a fully licensed full-time agent. I'm serious about this. This is going to be my career for life. And who do you know that needs to buy or sell a house in the next six months? Got it. I love that. So, Pat, give us one piece of parting advice. Let us know where we can find you, and we'll sign off. Well, um, I would say a piece of parting advice would be um, – Believe in yourself. Uh, I know that's kind of a cliche, but um, sometimes you have to believe in yourself more than other people believe in you, um, and believe that all you need is within you now. That uh, that that you know. And part of my putting out my book, it, it was kind of a, a thought process of if I can do this, then you can do this. You know, I was I was uh, labeled learning disabled. Um, in elementary school, I had a, a speech deficiency. I had to go to special classes because I used to say my, R, my R's like W, I say like Roger Wabbit, and I was made fun of because of that. Um, and, uh, you know, um, I didn't, I didn't, I, I, I wouldn't have been considered somebody who was going to, you know, do all these cool things and do all these great things. And I think that if I can do that, like you can do it. And part of the, most of that reason was because I did believe in myself. You know, I didn't, I, be, I believed and I, and I continued to build my belief system through affirmations and, and goal setting, which is all outlined in the book. Um, but, uh, that would be my bit of parting advice, uh, to help make that cliche a little bit more, uh, real and authentic. Um, and then you can find me easily. Um, I'm all over the place. You can find me on Facebook. Um, that's probably my social media of choice. I'm there a couple times a day. I have um, a website, patheiben.com, that talks a little bit about my book. 
Uh, Amazon.com is probably the best source to buy the book. They, I don't know why, but they come up. They they keep they they recently dropped the price. I mean, the cover price is 17 bucks. They're selling for like 12 dollars and 10 cents. You can get it on you can get it on the um, digital version for like 7 dollars and 50 cents now, which is a smoking deal uh, compared to where it started at. And uh, I don't make those numbers up. They just make them up because they take it out of their profit. Um, how they manipulate the prices. But anyways, uh, that's the easiest place to find me. And, and if you go to pathyben.com, you can uh, download uh, 50 free items. I put it out there for people who bought the book, but anyone listening to this call can get it even without buying the book. Um, they can get um, 50 free items of of value, of things we use at Pat Hyben Real Estate Group on a, on a daily basis that – can help them in their business, and it's just a zip file full of documents and employee contracts and things like that that are usable for all agents. That is great. Well, Pat, thanks for taking the time out and doing this show. We've all learned a, a ton from it. I know I have. My pleasure, Toby. I really had fun doing it, too. And well, You heard it, folks. That was Pat Hyben on why you should always follow up, focus on building your team, and go out and find a mentor. I hope that you can take one thing away from this interview and implement it in your business today. If you have enjoyed this session as much as I have, please go to iTunes and subscribe and give us a rating and review. If you'd like to keep getting these free mastermind sessions, please tell your friends and help us to continue growing our audience. Until next time, I am Toby Salgado, and I personally thank you for listening to Super Agents Live. Let's go!